The second you put up two microphones in that close proximity to the guitar and the voice, you're going to get this blurring caused by the phase discrepancy. You know, one mic just will not have that. And it just sounds very clear and very focused. And if you can, as you said, get it in just the right spot and make the commitment to that sound, you can get something really great. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by Sonarworks, helping you get the most out of your mixes by correcting the sound of the speakers and headphones in your studio so you get your mix right the first time. Are you sick of doing multiple mixes and still you can't get the low end right? How would it feel to have badass bass the first time? Get a 21 day free trial at sonarworks.com. Are you ready to rock the perfect mix? This episode is sponsored by OWC. Other World Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and use Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey, rock stars, it's Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Matt Bowden, a Boston based engineer, producer, and educator. While currently a freelance engineer, Matt has had a long association with Q Division Studios, where he was chief engineer from 2003 to 2010. While he has worked in a wide variety of genres, Matt particularly enjoys employing classic recording techniques while working on music made with a live ensemble-based approach. In addition to his work in the studio, Matt is currently an assistant professor of music production and engineering at Berklee College of Music in Boston. Today, he's going to talk about his experience recording in Boston and teach us how to get a great recording of a band live together in a room. So please welcome Matt Bowden to Recording Studio Rockstars. Matt, my man, are you ready to rock? I'm ready to rock. Dude, a pleasure, man. And, and um, I guess I'll preface this, Rockstars. Matt actually reached out to me a while back because we have been talking about a particular graph that lives here in the studio that lives up on the wall. Um, and I guess, I guess the title of the graph is the Q region, which is this chart that shows, um, you know, a, a curve on a graph that starts out high and then plummets way down and then kind of spikes up again down the way. But it basically is meant to represent a, um, a band entering the studio and doing first takes of their music and uh, I know I'm doing a lot of talking here, Matt, so thanks for your patience. But um, <laughs> it, it was uh, presented to me as originating at Sears Sound from Walter Sears in New York, uh, another wonderful um, producer and engineer and musician. I wish wish I could have had a chance to interview him. But Matt has come to uh, correct a little bit of the backstory of that. So maybe we can jump right in and start out with that, Matt, and um, tell us about, you know, who you are and going to Q Division, and maybe you can set us straight on that particular detail. Yeah, so uh, I guess to, to start with the chart and kind of gives you an idea about Q Division as well. So um, Q Division was started, I'm not going to tell the whole story because it's not mine to tell, but uh, it was started in um, spring of 86 by two uh, friends, uh, John Lupfer and Mike Deneen. And uh, soon after the studio started, I guess I was checking with John on this, and uh, I guess in May of 86, this uh, a client named James Jockin wrote up this chart. And uh, the the chart, it's it's still there at Q Division. It's all covered in, I don't know, coffee or I hope it's coffee. Um, and so this chart's been hanging up there forever. And I guess over the years, it was kind of widely photocopied. And it made its way to Sear Sound, which is where a lot of people have seen it. And apparently it also... Uh, 
the Sears Sound version was in the Wilco book, which I think is where it really kind of spread all over the place to um, different studios. Interesting. So, so uh, you'll see it at a lot of places. I guess you bumped into it in Nashville, and uh, yeah, so it's um, it's kind of spread around, but it it really originated at at Q Division. That's so cool, and that hence that's why it's called the Q Region. The Q Region, <laughs> yes. Which it I, I it's it's kind of a bummer to lose the mystery because I sort of think it's interesting. Like, what does the Q mean? <laughs> well, now tell us what what this chart is. Maybe you can explain a little further what the meaning of it is. Yeah, and maybe we can uh, you know put a copy of it in the show notes or something. But um, yeah, I think you know as you said, it's a it's a chart that represents um, it's a chart that represents performance over time, and uh, it, some of it's kind of tongue in cheek, um, but I think it has actually a lot of good lessons about recording. So as you mentioned, one of the f- the, the sort of peak performance initially is right when the band walks into the studio and. At that the first takes they play, that's when the performance is best. It may be a little loose. There may be a few mistakes, but the band is inspired and exciting, uh, yeah. excited. And as you continue along, and you've experienced this, and you you say, well, let's do it again. You know, you start doing more and more takes. The performance starts to really plummet to the point where, as you continue, you keep pushing and pushing. Uh, everybody gets kind of brain dead. And then yes. there's the mysterious Q region, which uh, after you reach this brain dead point, suddenly you get a, a spike of, ooh, it got really good. And then suddenly it gets really great. And then it's it's gone for good. So I, I guess what I think is interesting about this chart, besides that it's, it's kind of funny, you know, it has some jokes in it and everything. Um, I think it really illustrates the importance of time in recording and how important time is. Um, I don't know who said it, but um, there's there was a discussion about uh, the Rolling Stones in, in a book I read about, and um, I don't know if it was Glenn Johns or maybe Andy Johns was saying, you know, the Stones would be the worst band in the world for hours and hours and hours at a time, and, and they would just sound terrible. And then mm-hmm. all, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there would be this incredible performance, and you had to be rolling on that performance because that would be the only time it would happen. That's and, wild really makes me think about the Q chart that they were they were kind of living in in that Q region in the mysterious Q region. But I think for a lot of us, um, you know, if we're going into a studio and spending a lot of money and you know people don't have the budgets that they used to, certainly don't have the budgets of the Rolling Stones, we might not ever get to the Q region. So for me, what I try to do is get the performance in that initial hump and try and capture it right then. I put all my effort into being ready for that first take. Yeah. Well, you know, so there's a couple of questions about that is when I've looked at the chart here, one of the mysteries is you sort of squint at it and you look over at the left and you see the, you know, band enters the studio, second, you know, first or second take is kind of the the first peak. And then it goes down and then the Q region happens way later, but it's so it's so far to the right on the chart that you're looking at it and you're thinking like, Wait, is the Q region just ever so slightly higher than the peak of the band <laughs> during the studio? <laughs> on the on the original, it is the the Q region is actually the highest sort of transcendent peak. Oh, that's great. Um, but you know, a lot of us might not have time to get there. Um, well, so, that's what rehearsing is for. Maybe you know, maybe it's about um, I don't know. Maybe maybe that's maybe I'm misinterpreting it. No, no, I totally agree that rehearsing is definitely a part of it. Um, If a band is well rehearsed, then they don't need to, you know, figure out all the little technicalities. They just need to come in and play. Um, But, you know, I think as a, I think this sort of ties into some of my philosophy about what an engineer does. And I sort of feel like as an engineer, my, my highest responsibility, even, even more than the way something sounds is, is in capturing the performance. Um, yeah. because the performance is ultimately the thing that's valuable. And so, for example, a lot of people get ready to do a vocal and they say, all right, let's shoot out the microphones. And they set up four or five mics and the singer sings the song four or five times. And then they all decide which mic sounds best. Well, at that point, you've missed your opportunity to get the good performance because all, all that's the, left is the know, Q region. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, your only hope now is to go to the Q region. So to me, um, my feeling is like 
you know, the best microphone for the job is whatever gets the feeling happening fastest. And because my ultimate responsibility is is to be rolling at the time the performance is happening and to, and to be to capture it. Well, I think that's great advice, and I think that it's a, you know a reminder that there is a difference also between capturing a band performance in the studio and what you might do then versus approaching an overdub. But even an overdub has a first and second take, followed by a whole bunch of takes, possibly you know that that are all going downhill, and so that mm-hmm. that all makes sense. I do think that if you want to explore choosing a best mic, if that even really exists, which I think I think it can exist, um, it's best to do that well separated from the actual performance. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, I don't mean to sound like I'm poo pooing mic shootouts, um, but yeah, I totally agree that there's a sort of time and a place. It's sort of uh, like in sports, the difference between you know practice in the game, you know, like if the, you know, the guy's taking a foul shot in the game, the coach isn't yelling at him, you're like, keep your elbow straight or whatever, you know, um, because the game isn't the time to worry about those things. So, yeah. so I, I, I agree. I, um, I totally Spoken agree. Spoken like a true Bostonian and Celtics <laughs> fan right there. Yeah, right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I grew up with uh, Larry Bird, you know, and, and, uh, and Me that too. era. Um, well, cool, man. Well, so let's back up a little bit and tell us a little bit more about, you know, briefly who you are and how you got into recording and um, maybe how you ended up at Q Division and teaching at Berkeley. Yeah, so um, I grew up in Maine, and um, I guess I was always kind of interested in in recording. I, I wasn't necessarily super into music, but I can remember as a little kid taking a cassette recorder and recording TV shows off the TV, and I just thought it was really cool that I could, you know, play it back and hear the show again. Yeah. So, so even then, I think I had kind of a fascination with that. And um, now, were you, know, you doing? I, were you doing like me, where you take the the Panasonic, you know, with the two switches on it, and just jam the microphone up to the speaker of the TV and have to hold it there? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yes, exactly. So, um, as a teenager, I got you know interested in music and you know started playing guitar and things like that and. Um, you know, writing songs and playing in a band. And I kind of realized, I realized, you know, A, that I was never, didn't really have the talent or the drive to be a musician. Um, But I really discovered, like, the whole reason I was writing songs and doing things like that was because I wanted to record them, you know, and I had a four track and just got kind of obsessed with it and um, just was very interested in recording. And then by the time I, you know, I went to college and uh, got a degree in English, always sort of had in the back of my mind, you know, I'd really like to work in a studio. I don't really know how to do that. Uh, in my last semester in college, they just opened a studio at the, at the school. And I walked in on the first day and just immediately the second I walked into the space, I was like, this is where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. And it was just a matter of trying to figure out how to get there, you know? Well, I feel like that was my first experience of a recording studio. Um, I had already studied something else, kind of like it sounds like you you did. Um, I had been studying architecture, and then I, of all places, I was in Hong Kong playing in a band with my brother, and we went into a real studio to do a recording, and I was just sitting there looking around at all the lights and the big machines, and I was like, <laughs> wait, this is really fucking cool. I think I want to do this, you know? I, I Actually, the other thing that happened was when I was like 15 – we went to a, a kind of friend that we had made in town and recorded at his studio. And he had like a cassette eight track and he had like a little studio set up in his house. And I was, you know, I may as well have been in Abbey Road. I, I, I just was so excited. I couldn't believe it. Everything sounded so amazing. So even, you know, I, I just knew that that's where I had to be. <laughs> um, so tell us about uh, ending up at Q Division. Yeah, so... Um, I wound up going to recording school in Arizona, this place called the Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences. And uh, they had a, a required internship program where you would go to a city and, uh, and, and uh, get an internship. And so I decided to go to Boston because being from Maine, I, was, I, I wasn't going to be able to go to New York or L.A. It was kind of too, too big for me. And <laughs> too far Boston's, from lobsters. Yes, exactly. Boston seemed like a, a really big city at the time. And I, of course, I had some friends there. And I, there was a lot of great music coming out of Boston, and particularly coming out of Q Division. And I kept noticing, 
that studio's name on records that I liked. Um, and in particular, I kept noticing Mike Deneen's name, um, who uh, was one of the founders. So I wound up uh, interning there. And um, the uh, I guess the interesting thing was they had just moved. They were originally in Boston and they moved locations to Somerville. This is in like 2000. And so the day I showed up to intern, the studio wasn't even built. Like the, the day I showed up, the glass was being delivered, you know, for the control room. Wow. And so my internship kind of consisted of me doing carpentry and stuff around the studio. And they were kind of like, I think after a while, they kind of were like, wow, this guy must really want to be here if he's, you know, covered in sawdust and insulation and stuff. And that's kind of how I set myself apart and then eventually, you know, started assisting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's sort of interesting how what really allowed me to get into the studio was something that was kind of completely unrelated. Yeah, I think it was a little same for me, too. Um, you know, I had an opportunity to help do wiring. I didn't do carpentry so much, but a lot of wiring um, in both my internship and the first studio I was at. And those are, uh, being able to do a lot more than recording is a great skill to have when you want to start out in a studio. Um, and it, it is a great way to show them that you really want to be there and that you, you've, you've come to offer something. Right. Absolutely. Well, so, um, and then now you're teaching at Berkeley as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not quite sure how that worked out. I mean, over the years, I've interacted with various professors over at Berkeley and some of my friends who I knew more from the studio scene. So um, Mike Deneen, who I mentioned, I'm sure I'll mention him several times, uh, and uh, Matt Ellard, um, Sean Slade, some some local guys, um, they were all teaching over there. And so I kind of reached out and I don't know, maybe like a year later, they just kind of called me up and said, oh, we've got some courses. Are you interested in teaching? And so I said, sure. And I've been over there ever since. I guess I've been there for maybe three years now. And um, it's a pretty incredible place to work. I'm really glad that I'm that I'm over there. You know, the students, it, just to be a, surrounded with so much talent. And of course, there's a lot of talent in the music production engineering department yeah. as well. Um, so I don't know. I don't really know how I wound up there, but um, it's been great. A lot of history there. It's a school that's been teaching music and recording, you know, from the get-go, I guess. Oh, yeah. And, you know, particularly on the, the you know, the, the MP&E department, the production department has been very successful. But, you know, the, the level of musicianship that you can find among the students is is pretty incredible. So it's <laughs> it's it's great, you know, if you have a session in the in the studios there and you the you know the students put a band together you know there's going to be some kids who can really play yeah really i guess a challenge there is probably just making sure that you got a group of musicians that will let the other musician take a solo sometimes <laughs> yeah that can be a problem there's a lot of youthful exuberance for sure <laughs> yeah exactly youthful exuberance good way to put it all right so i like to ask guests on the show to share an inspirational quote get us excited by hitting the studio is there anything you want to uh, share starting off the podcast sure um there's this book called Art and Fear by David Bales and Ted Orland. It's a it's a pretty useful book. Um, but there's a quote in it. Um, it goes like this. Um, in large measure, becoming an artist consists of learning to accept yourself, which makes your work personal, and in following your own voice, which, which makes your work distinctive. So nice. this is an idea that really appeals to me. I think it can be helpful just in dealing with artists. You know, this book is really helpful in understanding the challenge that artists face. But I think it's also really helpful in our own work. Um, you know, so for example, learning to accept things as they are. So instead of always finding the flaw in something, if we put less energy into finding that flaw and trying to fix it, if we could learn to accept what it is and make it great, you know, um, I, th I feel like we spend a lot of time uh, in this fearful place of sort of second guessing ourselves and in, instead of learning to accept who we are and, and what we're good at. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that you can spend an awful lot of time worrying about what everybody else is doing too, you know, instead of just letting yourself do your thing. Absolutely. Because if you, if you, can, if you can find, you know, what it is that you do, your own voice then your work is suddenly distinctive and you're not doing all those things that other people are doing and maybe they're doing them better than you are, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, I just did an interview with Mixer Man and we were talking about some of these topics as well. And um, one of them was the idea of finding an audience of 
a much smaller size today that that um, you can reach throughout the world than than thinking about like you know gold records and things like that. Um, and that was sort of along the lines of an artist. Like if you could find a thousand to three thousand fans, you can really make a living and and get get forward in the world. Uh, sometimes it could take a while to reach those people, but it's it really exemplifies this idea of excluding all the people that are not your fans as well, you know? But it makes mm -hmm. me think about when you're talking about engineering and producing, uh, it might be a much smaller number even, you know? You might only need to find a hundred or a couple of hundred really high quality clients to be able to really move forward in, in doing this professionally. Right. Or, or, a, or a particular niche, you know, that you can sort of carve out for yourself. Like for me, I'm good at, setting up a band live in a room like that sort of ensemble based stuff. I'm not quite as good at, you know, building up a record from scratch, you know, and, and overdubs and things like that. It just doesn't interest me as much. I'm not quite as good at it, but I can find a small niche of, you know, jazz artists, blues artists, folk artists who are making more ensemble based music. And if I can reach out to them, I can sort of carve out a little niche for myself. Yeah. I think that's great advice. And it's very encouraging to us too. Um, so uh, let's jump forward and talk a little bit more about some of the specifics of what you do you've done. Um, well, as a teacher, uh, I wanted to ask you this: What uh, you know, with regards to live band in the studio and working with a lot of students that are new to this, what, what do you feel like are some of the most common mistakes that new engineers um, and or producers make when recording a live band in the studio? Well. I think a lot of people who are starting out or, or, or students sometimes might not even really understand that you can set up a band, everybody in a room, and make a record that way. Um, there's this feeling of, well, you know, if things aren't isolated, how can you punch in? Or if, um, if there's no click track, how can you, you know, how can you punch in or... Um, do overdubs or things like that. So I think a lot of people, there's just a misconception because the only way that they've ever been exposed to making records is doing it piece by piece. Yeah. Um, so just getting over that hurdle initially, sometimes, you know, sometimes I'll work with students and I'll set up a band and they'll be kind of amazed at the level of isolation, uh, even though the band is all in the same room and they're just kind of like, oh, I didn't know that you could do that. <laughs> Yeah. So part of it is just raising the awareness. And and funny enough, it can actually sound a lot better when you have the band all in one room, depending on what you're doing and uh, how it all comes together. Absolutely. And and if if you know, from my perspective, music is about the performance, as I said, but it's also about sort of um, it's about communication. So that's why I just really strongly believe as much as possible in a live approach. So the musicians are interacting with another, uh, one another, because in an overdub, the interaction can only go one way. You know, I can react to the music, but it can't react to me. Man versus computer. And, computer doesn't listen yeah. to man or woman. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, so, um, yeah, keep yeah, go going. Ahead. Well, I was, well yeah, keep, keep riffing on that idea if you got more to say about it. Well, I guess going back to your initial question of what, you know, what's a common misconception, um, I guess one to start off with and one that I faced in, in, trying to do this kind of work originally was, you know, you have to sort of accept that there's going to be minimal isolation when everybody's largely in the room together. Um, and so you initially sort of have this instinct of like, I'm going to try to isolate things as much as possible. And one of the obvious ways that comes to mind would be, well, if I separate things very far apart, because, you know, as sound dissipates with distance, obviously, if I put things farther apart, they'll be more isolated. But of course, it turns out that that's kind of exactly the wrong approach because as you separate microphones, the, the bleed that is coming from the other instruments into your close mic is now colored by the room. Yeah. And you sort of turn that bleed into reverb. So the, it's very counterintuitive, but the first thing you should try to do when setting up a band live is put them as close together as possible, <laughs> unless you're in a really stellar room and you can get more distance. But. Yeah. Or outdoors. With no walls. Oh, outdoors would be amazing. I would love to try that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I agree with that. And um, I think it was first Matt Rossbang who brought that up on the podcast, talking about bringing a vocal and a drum set closer together during the take rather than farther away where the, the snare would sound really, you know, kind of trashy across the room. 
it makes that vocal mic part of the drum set. Um, yes, so, exactly. So I think that's a great tip. Um, and, and then and you have to think of it that way. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say the uh, idea of not having a click track. Maybe you could talk about what are some of the challenges that you need to uh, think about if you're going to record without a click track and overdub, and what are some of the solutions? Hmm. Let me wait for this truck to go by. Um, let's see. Well, I think, um, I guess, in terms of click track, I think you know a common misconception about click tracks that I hear from a lot of bands is, uh, I'm sure you've heard this too, is they'll say, um, our drummer kind of has a hard time keeping a steady beat, so we're going to use a click track, as if the click track itself will help him or her keep a steady beat. Right. Um, which of, it's just, that's a very, very bad idea. Um, if your drummer can't keep a steady beat, it's best to record without a click track because they're not going to be able to play to one. So... Um, but in terms of working without a click track, um, so some of the challenges you'll face, I don't find overdubbing to be a challenge um, because, you know, you're just listening to the music as it goes by. The only place where overdubbing is really going to be a challenge is if there's a break, mm -hmm. you know, like let's say there's a breakdown verse with no drums and now we need to overdub the acoustic guitar. So in that situation... I would, if I'm now going to overdub an acoustic and I have this sort of free space and there's nothing keeping time and I've got to redo the acoustic, I might create a click track just for that section in the overdub. Um, so I can, yeah. you know, you, in Pro Tools, I can just identify a beat and then identify a beat eight bars later. And now I have a click track for that section. Mm, that's clever. Um, so I'll do that a lot, you know, if, if we have to overdub something where there's, you know, just empty space. Um, but I think the other thing about click track is you'd be amazed at, um, what you can do just cutting between takes. So it, particularly in a live setting where there's a lot of bleed among the instruments, it can sometimes be harder to punch in an individual instrument, but you can effectively punch in the whole band by editing in a different section. And a lot of people are very kind of fearful of doing that because they're like, well, if there isn't a click track, the two takes won't be at the same tempo. Right. But most of the time, if the band is good, they're, they're, it's going to be close enough. And, uh, you know, you can make those kinds of edits. I mean, that's been done since magnetic tape was invented. Yeah. Um, so there's nothing new to that. Um, and, and you shouldn't be afraid to, to make an edit across the whole, the whole band. Um, yeah, I agree. And you can do things like... Uh have you can actually do a band punch so you could have the band hear what they just did right up to that punch point so they've already got the right tempo in mind you know even without mm -hmm. a click in there and you can just do multiple endings and then go find one that's good and, and paste it on you know absolutely um all right so now uh what else are we going to ask about what about headphones i know headphones uh using headphones and not using headphones can be an interesting um, detail as far as a band live in a room together yeah, headphones are a challenge. Um, you know, obviously, if it's loud music, um, you know, if it's a rock band, you're probably, and people need to hear the vocals, you're probably going to want to use headphones. But even in that situation, you don't necessarily have to use headphones. I, I really like recording without headphones. Um, you know, the band is used to playing without headphones in their in their space. You know, they're used to hearing themselves in the space and maybe they have a PA. There's no rule that says you can't use a PA uh, in a recording studio. Yeah. Um, it, pr it provides an extra challenge. But, um, you know, you don't have to run everything through the PA. It could just be the vocals and, and just have a, a monitor wedge for the vocalist. Um, whatever makes the band feel most comfortable, I think, works the best. Um, one thing about headphones that I think a lot of people don't understand is that it's, it's much harder to, to get pitch, you know? So yeah. if you ever, if, if you're ever in a studio, you know, and you see the guitarist tuning their guitar, you know, by ear with headphones on, you should tell them to take the headphones off because the way that you perceive pitch is really different. And you find that with singers, you know, I'm sure you've had a singer who sings really great at live, but then they go to put on headphones and it's a totally different experience. If I had a singer like that, I would just put a, a wedge in front of them and record that way. Yeah. I think that's good advice. I mean, I know you can take an ear off sometimes and that can help a little bit with, it's interesting. You talk about guitar, guitarist tuning with headphones on, cause I've noticed when I'm 
tuning my guitar with headphones on, I feel acutely aware of certain things that are in tune or out of tune. Um, do you think that you might actually uh, run the risk of tuning your guitar, and then when you listen to it in speakers, you discover it's it's actually out of tune, even though you thought it was in tune with headphones on? Yeah, I suppose. Um that's interesting, though. I mean, I get your point about you can maybe hear more detail in terms of like the beats between strings. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I guess I guess the point is uh, be aware of it and try it both ways and make sure you don't, um, you know, make yourself take an extra hour to do something when you, all you need to do is take your headphones off. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I really like doing vocals with uh, without headphones when I can. Um most of the time, a lot of times people get a little nervous when you want to do that. But, you know, if you use the microphone's polar pattern, you place the speaker carefully, and sometimes you can even do a trick where you, uh, you know, have, keep the bleed and record it, record the bleed out of phase and then combine that, you can really eliminate a lot of that uh, bleed from the speaker. You know, there was a cool thing in the Abbey Road book um, where they talked about these, they called them the white elephants, which are these big roll around speakers for the studio for overdubs. Mm -hmm. And they would roll the speaker up to you and then they put a mic in front of it and you'd sing your harmonies, but you'd hear what you were singing to coming out of the speaker. And I think they put the mic in figure eight so that the, the mic was rejecting the speaker that was right there. And I thought that was a pretty fascinating thing. I've never really been able to replicate that in the studio, but I was always intrigued by it. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true because, you know, one of the big innovations of the Beatles was the use of headphones, which they didn't do until, you know, a few records in. Previously, everything was done exactly as you described with the, the White Elephant speaker. And yeah, the figure of eight, you know, you see a lot of uh, pictures of the Beatles singing, you know, John's on one side and Paul's on the other, and they're singing... Uh, they're singing into a figure eight mic, but one of the reasons that that figure eight is so good there is because the it rejects the sound from the side so completely, like much yeah. more than you know than a cardioid would. Um, it's the best. From its, I mean, there, there's rear. nothing the rejects absolutely. as well as that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, very cool. All right, so let's uh, let's jump into some specific records. Um, funny enough, as I was doing the research on this. I, I, like I mentioned before we started, I discovered that we were much more closely connected than than we realized, other than you know me coming from Boston as well uh, and the Q region. But you've also worked with um, Rye Kavanaugh and Session Americana and Jennifer Kimball. And Jennifer Kimball is my cousin. Rye is my, I guess, cousin-in-law. So, so maybe <laughs> tell crazy. us about working with those guys and what records you've done. Uh, gosh. Um, yeah, so Jennifer, I first met her when I was just getting started as an assistant. Um, uh, I was, and she came in to record some background vocals on a Patty Larkin record. And I got sent to studio B to go record the vocals. And I had, this was the first thing I had ever done kind of on my own. So I was a little nervous Great. and, uh, Jennifer started singing. And of course she has an incredible voice and I was like, Oh, this is going to be easy. You're like, and, I'm uh, so good at this. <laughs> yeah. I'm so good at this. It's always going to be this easy. Um, and yeah, so, I've known Jennifer for a while and, uh, you know, uh, met Rye and all the Session Americana people because they're just a great band here in Boston and uh, did a record with them. And, yeah, I did a little work on Jennifer's Avocet record, did a couple songs on that. And that was kind of a funny uh, situation where it's, um, I don't know, it gives, gives you a good illustration of kind of the, the family atmosphere of some of the Boston scene where um, Rye had given her a recording session for her birthday, but he, it was a su surprise. That's great. So a friend picked her up and brought her over to Q division and said, Oh, I gotta, I gotta go drop off a guitar at, at Q division. You, can you come with me? You know? And so she walks into the studio, all these musicians, some of the best musicians in Boston are sitting around and she's like, Oh my gosh, what are you guys doing here? This is so cool. And they're like, Oh, we have a session. She's like, Oh, who are you? Who's session? And they're like, yours. <laughs> and, uh, and it was great. We had a really fun day. We had a great dinner. It was, it was really, really fun. What a cool story. And of course with Jennifer, she's not the kind of artist who goes, Oh, my voice is just really not there today. <laughs> she can, <laughs> right. she always sings amazingly. She sounds like an angel. Yes. Yeah, she's beautiful. Um, well, so Avocet, uh, you know, had some really wonderful sounds on it. Um, I know you you maybe didn't record the whole thing, but would you like to talk about any of the things, um, some of the things that really I noticed uh, a lot, actually. <laughs> I noticed great drum sounds on that, a really great sense of space, like a really clear, clear, open and breathing sound 
um, for the recording. I thought the bass sounded wonderful. Of course, I thought the vocals sounded fantastic. And I wondered if you might talk about choosing the right vocal mic for Jennifer and, and whether there was a process to that. And I also noticed that there were some really interesting, like, distorted flutes and, and you know, stuff that sounded like, um, you know, the Omnichord through an amp and just cool stuff like that. So that stuff might have been after my involvement, probably in the overdub process, but I can probably speak to some of the other things. Um, sure. I mean, I guess it, uh, the, the, the vocal sound, I would say, um, I don't think I had to think too much about what mic to use, probably because on a vocalist that's that good, almost anything will sound good. But, you know, at Q, we have access to a lot of great vintage tube microphones. And so sort of my go-to mic for a female vocalist usually would be the the Neumann M49. And sure enough, it sound, sounded great on her. Nice. Um, but, you know, we're lucky to, I was lucky to have access to a U67 and a U47, all of that stuff is there. Um, as far as the bass, gosh, I can't remember who played bass on that. I want to say it was maybe Kimon Kirk. I can't remember. Um, was that electric bass? Um, I think on that stuff, I think it was, I think he might've brought his upright as well. Um, but again, that just comes down to the bass player. I guess this kind of ties into a lot of my philosophy too, which is when something is, is good, you can do almost anything. So I, it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of that bass is just a, a straight DI with maybe a little bit of compression from probably like a, a Neve compressor, mm -hmm. and that's it, you know? Yeah. Um, I try not to do too much. <laughs> Let the musician do it. Exactly. Um, and then how about drums? Did you record the drums on that record? Um, I would have done the... There were definitely drums on the one that I did. I want to say... Um, this is going back a way. So I want to say... Um, the drums are probably in the booth and I would guess on something like that, especially because it, we had a limited amount of time to work. Um, I probably would have mic them using sort of Glenn John's style, mm -hmm. which is that's sort of my go-to for most things. Um, and again, when you have a good drummer who can balance, balance themselves, that technique works really well, gives you a good sense of space and a, a really nice balance, very naturalistic sound. And that's sort of my, what I would typically start with. Well, let's break that down. Um, what, uh, let's describe it to the rock stars in case they haven't done this yet. What sort of mics would you choose? How many mics do you need to do a Glenn Johns drum miking? And then where would you put them? So yeah, you're looking at uh, basically four microphones. Um, you're going to have two essentially overhead mics. Um, large diaphragm condensers are best, so I would use you know U67s. Um, but any decent large diaphragm mic, it's going to be you know in cardioid, and one is going to be sort of over the snare drum or roughly kind of where the snare drum and the rack tom meet. It's going to be maybe six feet high, and that mic is going to be the main pickup. It's going to pick up most of the kit. Then you're going to have your other overhead mic is sort of placed over by the, uh, the floor tom. It's maybe a foot above, and it's sort of shooting back sideways across the kit, looking at the hi-hat and the snare drum. And that sort of picks up the floor tom, the ride cymbal, that sort of area of the kit. And um, you want to try to have them equidistant from the snare drum, so the snare is sort of... Um, in phase between the two and at about the same volume. Mm -hmm. um, you can use a tape measure, you can use a, or you can just eyeball it. I usually just kind of eyeball it. Um, microphone on the kick drum, like a any kind of dynamic mic you might use on the kick. Depending on the drum, it's either going to be inside or outside, but those overheads aren't going to pick up a ton of kick drum, although the, the floor tom mic will pick up a lot of the attack of the kick drum, which is actually really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got a snare drum kind of placed conven conventionally, a you know, SM57 or something like that. Um, Glenn Johns kind of famously uses that as a backup mic. So if he doesn't have enough snare in that that first overhead mic, he'll blend some of that in. That's great. Um, you know, and it's a great sound. It, 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 it's, it's not a very wide stereo sound. I mean, you can pan those overheads, but it sounds kind of crazy that way. Mm -hmm. I typically make it more mono. The, those two overheads don't need to be the same level. It's just kind of whatever sounds good. I usually use that, that side mic to kind of fill in the sound. And it's just a really simple sound, very easy to get, 
and gets good results. Where would you put the kick drum mic in this example? Um, well, if 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 there's uh, a hole, I'd probably put it inside. Depends a little bit on the music. If it's mm-hmm. a more folky thing, um, it might. I might not put it in the hole. I might put it outside. But if it's a if it's a rock thing and I need attack and I'm not getting enough attack from that floor tom mic, I'll put it inside. Um, if not, I'll I'll put it on the outside and I'm just getting a lot of depth from that front head uh, and getting the attack from the floor tom mic. But it kind of depends on the situation. Sometimes I might even cheat and put up a, a a mic inside and one on the outside and get a more sort of conventional kick drum that. Um, you know, you might be used to to doing. All right. So let me, let's talk about Session Americana a little more. Um, Did these guys show up with a whole bunch of acoustic instruments when you do a session with them? Yeah. So they have a lot of acoustic instruments. Um, They have a really interesting thing that they do live, which is they sit around a table and they basically have an omni microphone on the table. And, um, they have little condenser mics kind of around the edge of the table that sort of pick up the the instruments. And then they'll they'll uh, use the Omni mic as a vocal mic and they're all harmonizing together. And they'll literally push the mic, you know, to whoever's singing or if it's time for the <laughs> harmonica player to pay, take a solo, they push the mic over to him. And man, if you're ever in Boston and you get a chance to see this band, they are it's really fantastic. And they always have a rotating crew of people. So on that session, I knew they were going to come in with a lot of acoustic instruments. And I set them up in a circle, just like they would play live. And I tried to kind of replicate what they do live as much as possible. I think we wound up moving the singer into a booth, just so we had isolated vocals. And I think we put the drums in a booth as well. But everybody was very close together where they could see each other. And it kind of wound up where I just set up a bunch of mics and they became... I set up more stations, like sort of seats, and whoever came in and whatever they were going to play, those were the mics I was going to use. I wasn't going to stop the session to say like, okay, well, now it's a mandolin, so I need to change the mic, you know. Yeah. I tried to find something that would sound good on pretty much everything so the session could flow, you know, quickly. Um, so what does that mean to those of us who are thinking about something like that? Does that mean uh, a large diaphragm condenser might be more likely to cover most instruments, uh, uh, AKG 414, uh, or like a small diaphragm? I would probably lean, for acoustic instruments, I would lean to a small diaphragm. Um, probably for acoustic instruments, my favorite would be um, like a, a KM 140, a Neumann KM 140. Mm-hmm. Um, uh I just find that those are really, really good and they have um, pretty good isolation and the, the bleed coming into them sounds really good. Um, and in that sort of situation for like, for somebody who's singing and playing, um, I think I, on that session in particular, I probably set up a lot of dynamic mics on the vocals, um, just because everybody was so close together. So, you know, 421s or something like that on the, the sort of background vocals. Um, but yeah, mostly a small diaphragm condenser I find will work on most acoustic instruments. Um, do you find that, that there's a nice contrast at times between having a, a, like a hi-fi condenser mic for the lead vocal, but letting the backgrounds be dynamics and stuff that are tend to be just a little bit darker and a little bit sort of cloudier at times? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that contrast can be interesting, especially if the vocal, the lead vocal, you know, as you say, has more of a hi-fi sound. It's almost kind of larger than life. And the the dynamic mics sort of almost inherently sort of recede into the background a little yeah. bit. Um, at the same time, I like using dynamics on lead vocals as well. Um, like a lot of my favorite records from the 70s, you know, they're using... Um, SM56s or Shure 546s, those kind of mics on lead vocals, and they sound pretty good. So depending on the situation, I might even you know use a dynamic on the lead. Right on. Well, uh, let's take a break now for just a second. We'll come back in for the jam session. Rockstar is a reminder that you can find links to what we're talking about here with Matt on your mobile device. Just click right through or go to rsrockstars.com, and you can find the blog post there. Uh, I'll, I've also included a great YouTube playlist, um, so you can go listen to a bunch of Matt's work and, and records, and we'll see you guys in just a moment for the jam session. Hey 
You've already invested in your studio speakers, headphones, and treatment of the room. And you're passionate about creating great music, but your mixes don't seem to translate to the rest of the world. The reason is that your speakers and headphones are not telling you the whole story. The frequency response of your studio has huge peaks and valleys all throughout the low end that are completely screwing up your perspective. You may be doing your best to hit the bullseye with your mix, but your room makes the target of a perfect mix impossible to find. Wouldn't it feel great if there was a simple tool that could fix all that for you and help you get your mixes right the first time? Introducing Sonarworks Reference 4, the affordable solution to correcting your speakers and headphones in your studio. Built for Windows and Mac, Sonarworks helps you position your speakers, correct your control room imperfections, and get a million dollar sound on a home studio budget. Get a 21 day free trial at sonarworks.com and start your journey toward the perfect mix. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Other World Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your existing Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD drive, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey, rock stars! We're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Matt Bowden, joining us from Boston, uh, talking about working at Q Division Studios, teaching at Berkeley, making great records with bands live in the recording studio. So we're going to dig into some more questions about that. Matt, are you ready to jam? I'm ready to jam. So one of the bands that you included um, in our YouTube playlist, playlist is The Right Ons, and I wondered if you would talk about how you might have recorded a band like that in the studio, maybe. Describe what their sound is and, and uh, how you would approach something like that. Oh, yeah, the right ons. Yeah. Um, they are a band from Spain. I'm not sure they're together anymore, but um, I co produced that record with uh, Ed Velasquez, who's the studio manager at Q, and he's a bassist and just a real staple in the Boston music scene. But um, I didn't know much about them until I came in to work on the record. And um, they came over from Spain. And Ed texted me late the night before the session, and because we were, we didn't really know what was going to happen, and he he goes, I'm I'm watching them play at, at a club. He set up a gig for them in Boston, and he said the singer is on top of the bar playing a tambourine. They're all you know they're, the place is going crazy. So he's like, we're we're going to be good. So they're like super high energy, um, really exciting band um, that really awesome. involves the audience. So and just you know. Like, rock and roll. And, um, so we, you know, we took a real live approach. We had like maybe a week to make the record. So we, again, we took a real live approach because we knew they were an amazing live band. And, um, well, like we just set them up in the studio. Um, I think we cut vocals live. Um, but typically we probably overdubbed vocals, um, afterwards but we always cut a, a, a live vocal you know uh, to start with it's funny because and, um, listening to it and and to sort of thinking about what question i might ask i heard it as a very precise sounding recording i almost thought for a moment i was like hmm, i don't know if this one is a, a band live in a room so obviously they're that good and you guys really nailed it oh thanks yeah um yeah i mean it's uh it's a pretty it's a loud record um it's pretty rocking, but it's, you know, it's like just two guitars. It's just pretty much a band playing in a room. And, you know, the drum, the drum setup was very minimal on that. I think maybe three microphones. Um, so it's, um, it's just real, real straight ahead. No tricks. 
Um, so if you do a live vocal, what does that mean? Where would you position a bit? So it was a four piece, right? Where would you put uh, everybody yeah. in the studio for recording like that? And what size room might you want to record a band like that in one room? So that was done at um, the old Studio B at Q Division. Um, we, we've we since have a new Studio B. but um, that was And that's a pretty small room. Um, but so again, I'm trying to keep things close together. Um, the vocalist would typically, I would have the vocalist typically facing... Um, facing the drum kit with a cardioid mic uh, with the rear facing the kit. That's usually what I would do. Um, in some cases, if the music's not too loud or I want a roomier sound, I might use a figure eight with the um, with the null facing the drum kit and the singer, you know, singing into the the front of it. So the singer's sort of ninety degrees to the drum kit. Cool. Um, that that works surprisingly well. Um, I do a lot of um, some big band recordings and stuff like that. You'd, you'd be amazed at how well that works. Um, is there a process of positioning that mic just so, so that, and listening to the drums to see how well it's rejecting it or anything like that at the beginning? Oh yeah. So yeah, that's a great question. Actually something I wanted to touch on. So when I'm setting up the band, what I try to do is as I'm, as I'm getting my sounds, I have the whole band playing and I try to have all the microphones open. So, um, what I'll, what I typically will do is I'll, st I'll always start with the vocal mic, knowing that there's going to be a lot of bleed in the vocal mic. That's going to be the mic with the most bleed. So I will start with that and position it where the drums sound best. So, um, then I sort of build off of that and I start adding in the other instruments and I typically will have the whole band playing the whole time as I'm getting sounds. And as I add microphones, I try to keep those microphones open. So I'm always getting a picture of what the whole thing sounds like. Yeah. That's so clever. a lot of times, a lot of times when I'm choosing a mic, I'm actually not so much thinking about what the mic is going to sound like, you know, on axis, because it's, you know, it's fairly trivial to make a mic that sounds good on axis. Most mics do. But what I am thinking about is what does the off axis sound like? of the mic sound like? What's the bleed sound like? Is it going to be high quality? Is it going to be all weird and mid rangey? So that more than anything drives my microphone choice. Uh, that's really cool. And that's something that I kind of stumbled on myself from experimenting with this stuff um, is realizing that it the, the biggest problem is going to be how trashy is the drums and whatever else you got in there coming in through the vocal mic. So you might as well start by getting a great vocal thing going and then figure out how and what you can include, uh, you know, in addition to that. Right, right. Um, okay, cool. What other sort of stuff goes into the initial setup process? Um, what are some challenges that you're going to run into? I mean, as soon as you put headphones on somebody, do they just start freaking out and, and try and throw the whole thing for a loop? Or, you know, any tips about how you you include the band in this mic check? Um, I really try to keep it, feeling as natural as possible. I really want to try to keep what I'm doing as separate from what they're doing as possible. So that's one of the reasons I, especially if I'm doing kind of a live thing, I'll just ask the band to go out and play. I won't get headphones involved at all because especially if I can get them to agree to all be in the same room, they can at least rehearse without the headphones, and that gets them feeling very natural, like they're in the rehearsal space. And then I'm just out doing my thing uh, in the control room, and then I come in and maybe move, move a mic. I very rarely will ask someone to, you know, I, I almost never say, okay, can I hear the snare drum now? Um, I, I just try to avoid involving them in any of that sort of stuff so that what I'm doing can be really separate from what they're doing. And, um, yeah. Well, so if they do need headphones, then it's sort of like you've already got a thing going before you even sort of gently introduce headphones into the mix. Right. And yeah, so yeah, because I'm kind of listening to all the mics, I kind of already have something up. So once I've kind of got everything up, then I'll say like, all right, you know, we're going to do headphones. Let's get those going. Um, at that point, I can just essentially take my mix, you know, if I'm working in Pro Tools, I'll just copy my monitor mix onto the auxiliaries 
and then everybody is listening to my mix and then I can make changes as we go. But, um, uh, I like doing that or we also have, you know, eight channel headphone mixers. I'll do that as well. I'm kind of ambivalent about the headphone mixer thing. That's, I'm not sure how you feel about headphone mixers, but I, I don't use any headphone mixers here. There are many times where I think, man, I wish I had some headphone mixers, but <laughs> I've been making do with just a regular old stereo headphone mix um, for a long time. And then and then we kind of rigged up something that's a little bit complex, but you can mix in a little bit of more me into your mix. Oh, more me, to. yeah. Because usually that's all anybody wants more of. Right. I think there's a strong argument to be made that, you know, the mixing should be maybe left to to the the engineer because, you know, sometimes I go out and listen to somebody's headphone mix and it's just crazy. Yeah. And it's no wonder they can't hear what's going on. And I, I also think too, that the more you can get people, um, you know, everybody, I've had people literally say th something like, like, well, what are you doing on your guitar? I don't know because I like, I've got you turned all the way down in my mix, <laughs> which is, you know, that's just crazy to me. Like, because we're trying to make music together. That, that's just crazy to me. So th yeah. things like that will happen with, with, with headphone mixers that make me a little nervous. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I've heard feedback from both sides of the, the equation there. And um, I agree with you. I, I think that the important thing is that everybody has a really great sounding mix in their headphones. So like, however you can get there, that's what's really important. And I think that um, there are those times where, you know, the drums are right next to you and it is just hard to hear anything other than the drums right next to you. It could mean that the band's not playing at a, at a good balanced volume, um, but it could also be that you might need to hear more of your bass direct, for example, or whatever it is. Right, right. I find that you know if you can avoid using headphones, the the band will play at a at a more balanced volume, and that I mean that definitely makes your life easier. Yeah. All right. So another band that you had in there was Eli Paperboy, um, which had some great horns, um, and then I think you'd work with the Mighty Boss Tones as well. And I wondered, you know, what advice you have about recording horn sections? Can that be done with a live band take in the studio? It definitely can. Um, Let's see. Let me think about, about those. The um, so the Eli Reed session was something that uh, I was producing, and he's like a sort of you know '60s soul kind of thing. Um, and so we were really trying to be true to that kind of sound. And uh, I believe what we wound up doing on that one was we had the horns playing live, but um, after a few takes, some of them start their chops started to get a little sore. So we yeah. we had we had the part. And at that point, I kind of felt like uh, I don't want to. I don't want to get to the point where they can't play. So we wound up getting a take without the horns, and um, then we overdubbed them. And on on that one, what I wound up doing was I just set up an Omni uh, large diaphragm condenser, probably a U forty seven, and just placed the section. You know, it was probably a baritone, tenor, trumpet, and just placed them at distances. Uh, and let them balance themselves because, you know, they're a section, they know how to balance themselves. And it, it sounded great. And I think it would have sounded, I think it sounded better than had I set up, you know, three different mics for everybody and had them isolated. Yeah. I think when you're recording a section, it's better to let them mix themselves. Um, so that does bring up another good point, which is when do you make the decision to remove an instrument or some instruments or some vocals from the equation in a live band recording? When is it the right move to make? And, um, you know, when you hear people talk about, oh, well, don't worry about so-and-so because he can just replace his part. Is that a red flag to us? Maybe it's a, maybe we should just not have that instrument in the mix right now? Yes, definitely. Um, I think, yeah, if, if someone is unsure of a part, I would say if we if we're not sure that we want to hear that part on the record, let's let's overdub it, because my feeling is when we're recording live, pretty much everything we're, we're making the record right now. Everything we're hearing is going to be on the record. So if you're not sure about the part, then let's sit out and we can overdub it. Um, obviously, if somebody can no longer perform the part for whatever reason that might be, we could overdub it. Um, but yeah, I think it's a red flag when somebody says, oh, we can like, we'll punch it in later or something like that, because you might not always be able to punch something in or replace it um, because, you know, the bleed from the original track is going to be on other tracks. 
So that's definitely something you need to be kind of hyper aware of. Having said that, you'd be amazed at what you can get away with punching in. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's really astounding. If you haven't tried it, you know, the, the rock stars, if they haven't tried it, um, you'd really be amazed at what you can get away with. Well, especially things like scratch vocals and replacing of if you have the right lyrics and you and you're pretty right on with the melody, you know, you go overdub a vocal and you hear the the ghosting of the old one, it ends up being this cool doubling effect that that can sound really awesome, you know, that might have been hard to achieve otherwise. Yes, and you know, you hear that sound on tons of our favorite records, you know, like you listen to Stones records yeah. or things like that. That's some of the cool kind of I don't know, mistakes or the, the thing that kind of shows you that it, like this, this was made by human beings. I, and I like stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then another comment, you talked about the horns um, and, you, and you felt like they were getting a little tired. So rock stars, if you haven't worked with horn players um, yet, you have to be aware of something called embouchure. So I, the first time I did it, we were just trying to push him just like the other instrument, do lots of takes of what if takes and, you know, maybe we'll use it later takes. And horn players, their their muscles for their lips, their embouchure, it just wears out, and then they just can't play after you know a lot a lot sooner, I'd say, than a guitar player, a bass player, a drummer can keep playing. Absolutely, yeah, something to be aware of. Yeah, um, and uh, what was it? I felt like there was something else in there. Oh yeah, the idea of a musician that maybe um, you know is thinking they'll figure it out later, so don't. Don't worry about what I'm doing. Even if that instrument is isolated, it's amazing how just having somebody playing kind of poorly or wrongly in the take, it's going to influence everybody else and what they're playing. And it can be easy to miss that and not notice till later when you're like, man, that the rest of the band really wasn't locked in because of so-and-so. Mm -hmm. So just just a I, heads up on that. I you know, going back to something else you said about about scratch tracks, one of the things that I really try to convey to people um, when I'm working with them is I don't really, I don't have a concept of scratch tracks. My whole thing is everything that's happening now will be on the record or we should act like it's going to be on the record. Because one of the things is if you say something is scratch, you're saying it doesn't matter. And so particularly like a scratch vocal, right? Like um, if you're saying it doesn't matter, then immediately the per level of performance is sort of like, well, I don't really need to commit to this. I don't need to commit to this performance, to this song, to the moment that's happening right now. And so my whole thing is like everything that's happening right now is real. This is going to be on the record. And it creates, I think, more of a more intensity, uh, maybe a little more positive pressure in the performance. Um and you get better takes that way, in my opinion. Yeah, well, especially with vocalists. I mean, I, I remember first noticing that with my own band, when our singer would kind of, you know, need a break and want to sort of phone in his vocal part, it was really difficult to play an inspiring take as a band. But if he would deliver as if it was the take, it made it so much easier for the rest of us to, you know, know what to do and, and perform it well. Yeah, yeah, totally. So another band that you did and sent in is uh, GA20 Tell Me Baby, which has kind of an old school shuffle groove to it. Um, I noticed the drums kind of sound a little bit like they're back in the room. And I wondered if you wanted to talk about what you remember from that session or if if how sometimes the effect of having stuff sound like it's the back of the room is more appropriate on a mix. Yeah, so that's a project I've been working on the last few months. Um, they're a local uh, blues band, and they're kind of doing, uh, they're sort of doing this uh, kind of more modern take on vintage sort of blues. So they, when they called me, they were like, "Yeah, want, we want it to sound like a like a chess record." And so I've, we've been doing some sessions together, and we did a, a video session, and that's the one you're talking about. And mm -hmm. so my approach for that was after you know I'm a big fan of chess records from the, you know, blues records from the fifties and doing a little research on how they were recorded. And so my approach to that recording was literally what I read from how chess would approach things would, I set up a vocal microphone and then had them play. And I went in and listened and what I couldn't hear, I put a microphone on or what I wanted to hear more of. So I was like, well, I don't have quite enough guitar. Let me put some mics on the guitars. And now I don't have quite enough drums. Let me put up a mic on the drums. But most of the sound is the vocal mic. Ah, cool. Would you have the vocal mic in Omni or would it be in cardioid still facing the vocalist? 
Well, in the in the in the recording sessions we did, um, it would be cardioid, um, but it's facing the drums. They were probably set up like they're playing on stage. The the video that you're referencing um, was that we actually cut that in the lounge of this uh, st- studio in Boston. Nice. And and so in that case, the the lounge was like this sort of glassed in area, this kind of shoebox sized area. Not a great sounding room, not meant for recording. And in that case, what I did was I used a figure eight mic and had the figure eight mic um, uh, 90 degrees to the drums, so rejecting the drums in the null like uh, we talked about. We heard about that before. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so set up like that, but uh, the most of the drum sound is, of course, coming from the reflections in the room. So, it, again, it was a matter of setting up that mic and thinking, okay, what do I need to hear more of? Let's go put a mic on that. So the only mic on the drums in that particular video, there's a, a Biodynamic uh, 201 that's sort of like in between the kick and snare drum, and there's probably almost none of it in the mix. And almost the whole mix is probably that that uh, figure eight vocal mic. Yeah, very cool. Well, um, I really like that idea of the vocalist Mike, you know, having the having his back to the drums like a live stage, so that that mic is actually hearing the drums right over his shoulders. And that's a clever way of doing it. I don't. I think I would have almost always turned around the other way in the studio. So. That's what I love about doing this podcast. It's like I'm just really excited to go hit the studio and try out some of these new ways. Well, again, it's that question. If if you know there's going to be a ton of bleed, the the room I was in was super loud, if uh, super live. If you know there's going to be a lot of bleed, the way to make the bleed sound best is to have it be on axis. Yeah, and just accept that it's going to be there. Yeah. Um, all right. Very cool. So, um, how about Nate Campany and the Serenade? Serenade. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his his. Uh, Name no, right. That's correct. Yep. But um, I noticed that, you know, and the, again, this is a video accompanying the what sounds like the studio track. Acoustic, he's playing an acoustic guitar and singing uh, on the video. But when I listen to the, the music, the acoustic is sort of panned to the right. The vocals are in the middle. And I wondered if you wanted to talk about when, when do you want in the studio to record the vocal and the acoustic guitar together versus separately? Obviously, on on this episode, we're really talking about a, a lot of live in the studio, so maybe it's always together. But maybe you can just talk about that. You know, how do they sound different if you record them separately versus together, and why would you want to do it? Cool. So yeah, that brings to mind a couple things. So on on that recording, everything is live, with the exception of the acoustics are overdubbed and the vocals are overdubbed. And when we when we cut the live track, they. Nate and a few other people were playing acoustics, but they're coming through a PA, um, but not mics because I just couldn't get a good a good sound um, it, live in the room with all the other instruments. And there's he's singing through a PA, but all of that stuff was o- then overdubbed. So new guitar tracks, new vocal tracks, separate. Um, there have been instances though when I'm thinking of another artist I worked with, um, Rachel Cantu. She's a fantastic singer. And I was doing a record with her and we, we, tr- we did the track and I said, okay, let's, let's do, let's redo the vocal now. And I, you know, she was previously singing and playing guitar together. I was probably using like an RE20 on her voice. I said, let's set up the, you know, big sexy tube mic and get you singing on that. So she sang and it sounded pretty good, but it didn't sound the same way as when she was playing the guitar. And so I kind of found out that she's just sang differently when she, her, she yeah. played her guitar. So I decided right away, like, well, the voice is what this is about. So from then on, every time we recorded a vocal, even if we punched in, we were going to punch in something, I would punch in the guitar as well, and she'd be playing. So the guitar and vocal just became one track kind of together. I mean, they were on separate tracks, but you know what I mean? I treated them the same. Yeah, well, you know, one of the first things I remember trying, too, was, um, you know, sometimes it's a little frustrating the sound that I could get with the the vocal mic and then a guitar mic and you know neither one of them somehow sounded quite right to me maybe maybe a vocal mic I'm more we're more used to hearing the voice up close on the mic but with an acoustic guitar I, I don't often like the sound of the mic up close on the acoustic mm-hmm. so I tried doing a session where we just took a U67 and it was a nice sounding room and just you just found just the right balance out in front of both the voice and the guitar and it's pretty remarkable how you can get this wonderful, you know, 
blend of the two instruments. Of course, you're really committed to that balance as well, but sometimes oh. that's a cool way to do it. I'm I'm so glad you said that because I've had the exact same experience of um, of doing just that and being amazed at how good it sounded. And I think what that brings up for me is, you know, we're we're always very um, attuned to you know uh, amplitude distortion and um, the various kinds of distortion that we might find in a recording and trying to avoid those. But we don't often think about phase distortion and. At the second you put up two microphones in that close proximity to the guitar and the voice, you're going to get this blurring caused by the phase discrepancy. And, you know, one mic just will not have that, you know, um, and it just sounds very clear and very focused. And if you can, as you said, get it in just the right spot and and make the commitment to that sound, you, you can get something really great. Yeah, I, I remember being struck by how much low end came out of the acoustic, too. You know, that was one of the balancing issues uh, is just having that be just right. Yeah. And, you know, it occurs to me that if you're doing the close miking thing, um, you're trying to get isolation from the vocal and you're getting the mic closer and closer and closer and getting more and more low end that you then have to alter somehow, probably with equalization, which then alters the sound of the voice in, in the guitar microphone. Yeah. So, again, it helps you avoid that problem. Um, all right, cool. So let's jump to another one, the Blue Ribbons, um, Fooling Around. It's a great jazz band with the piano player singing as well. Again, this may be a video. I think it was probably like a recording that accompanied the video. Um, but the band has got an upright bass in it. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to talk about what are some of the challenges of recording upright bass and and how did you record that band? What 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 do you want to share about doing a jazz band like that? Sure. Um yeah, well, well, upright bass. So every every uh, engineer has their sort of bet noir, the the instrument they fear. And mine is probably <laughs> upright bass. I don't. What's yours? Upright bass. <laughs> oh, okay, great. All right. Well, um, here's here's some of the approaches that I take um, on that particular recording because there's an electric guitar and loud drums, and um, I probably set up a DI. And I probably had a small diaphragm condenser, like a KM140 or a KM86, uh, a KM84, sorry. Um, I've since changed my approach a little bit. Um, one thing I do, particularly when recording jazz, uh, like a more traditional jazz band or a big band, is from researching how some of these records were made, um, what I've wound up doing on upright bass is I take an Omni mic. Um, traditionally, this would have been the the Alltech uh, Coke bottle mic, the old tube microphone. Oh yeah. Um, and what they would do is uh, wrap that in some foam and p put it under the uh, bridge of the oh, instrument. Oh shit! Wow. And it's facing up, and it the diaphragm winds up being kind of just under the the fingerboard. And um, so. I started thinking about that and trying to figure out how I could do it. And um, I started using, uh, I have an Electro Voice. I'm a big Electro Voice fan. I have a 655C, which is an Omni dynamic mic. And uh, it's very long. And I did the same thing. And man, it works. Um, the, what I like about it is because it's Omni, you don't get proximity effects. So yeah. when you you know, when you use the, a cardioid mic and you kind of put it near the F hole or whatever, you just get an unbelievable bass boost and you have just no clarity. Yeah. So then you're saying, well, I'll add a second mic up by the, you know, to get the plucking. But then now you're using two mics instead of one, phase problems, all of that. The Omni thing um, eliminates that. The positioning of it, it, it picks up plenty of low end because it's, you know, I mean, the bass is just putting out low end from everywhere. And because it's so close to the fingerboard, you actually get a pretty good sound from, you know, the plucking of the strings. But it's sort of positioned where the capsule is looking up under the, the where the fingerboard sort of uh, cantilevers, yes. right? Yeah, it, yes, exactly. It's pointing, pointing up like that. And the other thing that's great about that is the, if the bassist moves, the mic is moving with him or her, because when you set up that, that cardioid mic outside, especially if you're in a loud environment, and you're trying to get it close for isolation. If the bassist moves 
one inch, the sound changes radically. And I can guarantee <laughs> the bass is going to move an inch. Yeah. You know? It's kind of hard to hold an upright bass perfectly still. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So I feel like at this point, rock stars, we need to have like a um, some sort of um, – you know, like award bell or something, you know, like a, like a prize ding that happens in the podcast whenever we get a new tip that we've never heard before. Cause I think you would have, you would have ring that bell a few times already on this interview, Matt. <laughs> That'd be cool. It's like chick ching, you know? <laughs> so that Omni mic underneath the upright bass, uh, underneath the fretboard like that, that's a great tip. And, and I guess thought you what? were going to say it. Oh, yeah. well, I was going to say, I, ahead, I don't have a, I don't have the uh, 150 Coke bottle mic, but I do have the M20 lipstick, which is the same capsule with a little oh. tiny tube in it. So I'm going to be able to try that. Oh, man, I've always wanted to use one of those. That's so cool. Yeah, that would be a little short for that. Uh, but you can like maybe stick it to another microphone. Yeah, or I'll something. just put it on a stick. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Awesome. But you were about to say something. Oh, I was going to say, I thought you were going to suggest having a, uh, like a support group for engineers who are afraid of upright bases. <laughs> we can do that too. <laughs> uh, if you want to manage the Facebook group, it's consider it done. Um, so what about recording the jazz band? I know another thing was vocals and piano together. Do you want to make any comments about um, best ways to record live vocals with a piano and, and, or what are some of the issues that you didn't expect to run into that you're going to run into? Hmm. So on the recording that you're referencing, um, that one would be, that one's pretty easy because uh, the lid of the piano is closed. So sometimes uh, in, a, in a live environment, I might mic the piano closed. Um, Great. How do you do that? Yeah. Well, let's see. What would I do? A um, couple different ways. I've found using PZMs on the lid. Um, placing them sort of one on the higher register and then one sort of where the, where the strings sort of cross in the lower register, if you're on like a, not a, a full size grand, but, mm -hmm. um, where the strings cross, um, sort of how you might conventionally mic, uh, inside a piano with a spaced pair, mm -hmm. just doing that, but taping those to the lid that can work. Um, I recently tried out, uh, um, I made a sort of, to have the lid closed, I made a uh, sort of a sling almost out of like gaff tape and and uh, stretched gaff tape between the braces of the, of the, uh, of the harp. piano. Yeah, of the harp, exactly. And then taped uh, like a 414 to that. And man, I got a really good sound that way. I was really surprised at how good it sounded. The only problem was trying to keep the tape from sagging, you know, in the middle of the take. Um, and that would be with a closed lid again. And would you do an Omni for something like that up close or would you do a uh, cardioid looking down? Um, probably usually a cardioid. If I can, I'll do a wide cardioid. Um, if I've also just stuck a mic to the lid, like just stick a 414 to the lid. And in that case, I might... Um, make it Omni because then you're sort of turning it into uh, you're turning that mic into a PZM because it's, right. it's stuck to a boundary. So I would then uh, make it Omni. Um, give us some tips about the questions that maybe nobody's thinking to ask. How in the world do you stick mics to the lid of a piano? Oh, just gaff tape. Okay. Um, so just and, put a piece of tape over it and tape it on there. Yeah, and and, it stays. yeah. And really, really tape it down. Yeah. Kind of make a little, a little, you know, sling for it and then just really tape it down. Cool, cool. All right, um, let's jump forward to, uh, here's a cool record that was on your discography, Mission of Burma, Get Off. Huh. So we're taking I, us back to some great Boston punk rock days. <laughs> I mean, this is like straight out of the books. Um, what I, was it? What was the book I read? Uh, this story, what is it like? Um, this is the story of your band or something where they oh, talk about uh, this band could be your life. That's it. This band could be your life. That's a great, great, book. great history of punk rock and Boston and all that. Yeah, so I just I kind of just put that on there for for, for cred, you know. Um, yeah, I worked with them. They've done a bunch of stuff at Q Division that I I didn't work on, but I got to work with them through the Converse Rubber Tracks program, which is kind of sadly defunct now. But Converse had a studio in Boston and would have bands come in, and typically up and coming bands who never have been in a studio before, and give them a free day of studio time. And the studio was fantastic, and they brought in Mission of Burma just to kind of do something cool, you know, to bring in some, some, you know, uh, important bands from Boston history. So I, I got to work with them. Um, 
and it was really exciting. It was, you know, maybe a six hour session and, uh, I just kind of followed their lead and they, it was, it was for a split single where they were covering, uh, a band called Mets and Mets was covering them. So, um, I don't think they had a lot of preconceived ideas about, you know, how they wanted to sound uh, other than they wanted to sound, you know, raw and like mission of Burma, but they kind of let me just do whatever. And so it was it, kind of a it, throwback recording in a way. In a way, yeah, yeah. And so I kind of just felt free to kind of, you know, make it sound really aggressive and really raw, which is something that I'm not used to doing. But it was kind of freeing to just be like, well, what if I turn that preamp up two more clicks and really distort it, you know? That's and it great. was it was really cool. Um, awesome, man. Uh, I, another thought that popped into my head was to just simply ask you, are, would you like to say anything about some of the great music or bands that have come out of Boston just for the rock stars who've made it? Maybe don't realize how much of a music hub Boston is or has been over the years. Um, do you want to give a shout out to just some of the, the most important music that comes to mind? Oh, gosh. Um, well, there's there's so many going to so many era, yeah, yeah. eras. Not, but... not to put you on the spot, just, just for, <laughs> first thoughts. I mean, I think well, of the band Boston. Uh, yeah, certainly the band Boston. All, all that stuff was recorded probably two miles from where I'm standing over in Watertown um, in, in his basement. Um, yeah, so, I mean, going back to the 70s, like Boston, but I mean, the band that comes to mind for me would be The Cars. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I love that band. Um, Were they recording in Boston as well? Um, the early stuff they, and they actually had a studio in, in the city on uh, Newberry street that they, they worked out of, um, as well. But the, the early stuff, especially the, the demos that were, you know, became local hits and then became the first record that was all done in Boston for sure. That's great. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of great sort of lesser known bands from that period too. So, you know, mission of Burma from the sort of late seventies, early eighties, but, um, there's a great, um, kind of punk uh band called uh, the real kids i've actually done some work with them as well um the neighborhoods um really just great bands from sort of the late 70s early 80s and then the other period that comes to mind would be kind of the early 90s where um boston had a big resurgence with you know bands like buffalo tom and um Belly and Julian Hatfield. Yeah, Lemonhead. All, all of those bands. We, we, heads, we forgot to mention the Pixies, too. Oh, yeah, the Pixies, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, when you get outside of punk rock and, and rock and indie rock and stuff like that, you get, you know, uh, jazz musicians like Pat Metheny coming from there and from the Berkeley scene as well. Oh, totally, yeah. Um, well, cool. So lots and lots to explore. Oh, um, uh, the Jay Giles Band. Oh, did I not mention them? I'm not like, yet. I no, see? but 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 we covered <laughs> that on previous episodes on the podcast too. Okay, there you go. Yeah, America's Rolling Stones. They're a great band. Oh, and uh, Aerosmith. We didn't mention Aerosmith yet. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of bands. <laughs> All right, cool. So lots of history and research to do, rock stars. All right, well, let's jump into some of our outro questions. Uh, before I do that, uh, Matt, is there anything that, that I didn't ask you about that you wanted to cover before we kind of move to some of the jam session questions? Hmm. I don't do you think have so. any? Do you have a message for your students at Berkeley? Oh gosh, I guess they would go back to the the quote, which would be you know sort of like find out who you are, find out what you're good at, and and follow that. Yeah, I like it. Um, awesome, man. Well, so when you started out in recording, what do you feel like was holding you back? Hmm. Let's see here. I think I wrote this down. It sounded like nothing. Like you were just like, yeah, I just like recording. That's good enough for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess I would say probably the same thing that holds me back, you know, holds me back now. But I think especially at the beginning, you know, just a lack of confidence. Um, I think maybe this feeling of um, that there's a right way to do things. And if I don't do it that way, I must be doing it wrong. Mm. And and this this feeling of... Uh, you know, seeing somebody else do it their way, then trying it and realizing it didn't work for me. And so it took, I think, a long time for me to figure out, like, I have to figure out what I'm good at and what I can do. And, and that might not be the same as what some of these other people who are great, you know, can do. All right. Now, what about some of the best advice you remember receiving? Uh, let's see. Best advice. Oh, um, to go slow when you're feeling pressure. 
Um, so a lot of times in the studio, you know, there's a, a lot of pressure. I tend to be a kind of high strung person. So I can remember being on a session as an assistant and being very nervous and trying to change the reels and kind of fumbling around. And um, the engineer I was working for is a good friend of mine and teaches at Berkeley as well. Uh, Matt Ellard kind of just stopped me and he said, slow down, take a breath. And it was really, really good advice. And uh, it kind of reminds me of this, one of my favorite sayings. I, I guess it's a Spanish saying, but um, yeah, we're, we're, we're in a hurry, dress slowly. Yes, yeah, because so, if you don't, you trip on your pants and you fall down exactly. and knock yourself out. So I try to be really conscious of that at this, in the studio. When something is going wrong, if I'm trying to troubleshoot something, I will like physically make an effort to like slow my body down really do things slowly and it calms me, helps me focus and I can actually solve the problem much faster if I slow down. Yeah, it's good advice. I like that. Um, all right. So how about, um, you know, you've already shared a bunch, but how about one more recording tip, hack or secret sauce, something the rock stars could use on their next session today? Hmm. Um, yeah, a quick one might be, uh, if, if you're, if you're going to set up a stereo recording, like something where you might use a coincident pair, like say an XY where the mics are crossed or a bloom line where the mics are crossed, rather than setting it up as a traditional XY, try setting up a mid side pair instead. Yeah. Um, my feeling, my reason for that is that once you matrix the, the, the mid side down, it winds up being equivalent to an XY but the advantage is that the center of your image is on axis with a mic. If you, you use a regular XY, the sort of center of the thing you're trying to capture is all off axis. And so the frequency response isn't quite as good. But you can get the same effect by using midside, but the center will be much more focused and clear. Um, if you were to grab two mics from the studio right now to set them up as a midside pair, what would you probably grab? And is there, you know, would you would it be a couple of stands? Would you use some sort of um, stereo bar for that? What what tips do you have for easily setting up a midside? Uh, if I want them to be matched, I'd probably take uh, you know two four fourteens. So you know, one in cardioid and 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 one in uh, figure of eight. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm doing the bloom line thing, I can do bloom line in midside as well by you know using two figure eights. Um, I would typically, I think I've typically use a stereo bar. Um, sometimes I use, I don't know even what it is, but it's a little thing that you can sort of clip onto a stand. So you can, you know, attach a mic like onto the shaft of a stand. Mm -hmm. And I'll use that to hold one of them and then use the regular portion of the stand to hold them both. If I can help it, I don't want to use two stands just because it takes up a lot of space. Yeah, it's also hard to get that, you know, second stand to sit just right and not wiggle around on near yeah. the other mic. Especially once, you know, the guitarist bumps into it or whatever. And now, um, rock stars, you need to, you can just, well, you need to decode that sound so you hear it in stereo right away. Um, you can either manually decode it, and that's a little bit complex and takes a moment to explain, but luckily you also don't have to. You can just put it right into your DAW and pop a, an MS decoder plugin on a stereo track and it will spit out stereo for you. Do a lot of the MS decoders give you the balance levels too between the two mics? Or I guess you could put a trim plugin before that and balance them that way. Yeah, um, I typically will. I typically will just um, decode it going right in. So I, then I just have a stereo track. But the the decoder, if I do use one, uh, the one that I use, I think is by um, it's free. I think it's by. Um, by uh, Wolf, but the 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 Wolfpack guys. Oh yeah, they make some pl really cool plugins, and they make a mid side one, and it allows you to to alter it right there in the plugin. Those guys aren't Berkeley grads, are they? No, they're not. But I think they should come and do something at the school because they're super cool. They are awesome. They they um, rock stars. If you haven't seen their videos floating around on Facebook and stuff like that, just these incredible funk jams that sound like they're programmed, but they're performed. <laughs> Because <laughs> that's one way to describe it. Um, Talk about carving out a niche. Yeah, really. Um, all right. So now, how about uh, sharing a favorite um, hardware tool or just something you're excited about? Something you want to tell the rock stars about? Oh gosh, I like my um, I like my Pendulum ES8 compressor or limiter. Um, it's a tube limiter. It's kind of like 
fair, childy. And I just really like that thing because I can do, it can be really, really transparent or I can really drive it and get some really crazy sort of 60s, uh, you know, drum sounds. If I want to get like a really beatly drum sound, I can put it in that thing and really crush it and get those sort of explosive cymbals and that sort of thing. Nice. So the, the Pendulum Audio ES8, really great piece of gear. All, right. All right, dig it. How about a uh, software tool? Um, I'll, I will already mentioned the Wolfpack um, mid-side thing. I will also say... Um, the uh, the stuff that um, the stuff that Ian Shepard is doing. You had him on the show recently, but the um, uh, the, dyna- the dynamiter penalty and yeah. the dynamiter that thing's amazing and so helpful because you know I kind of find myself doing a lot of projects where I'm just like uploading it to YouTube or something. So I am almost kind of the mastering engineer, mm-hmm. and um, his stuff is super helpful. All right, so rock stars, a reminder, a recap on that loudnesspenalty.com is a site where you can go and you can just um, check your mixes to see whether or not the, all the streaming services are either going to turn them up or turn it down or whether you hit the, the, the nice sweet spot. And then if you're ready to have a tool that will allow you to arrive at these conclusions while you're mixing directly in the DAW, you can go check out Dynameter, which is a plugin that makes everything look like it's 1980 again with the colors, and it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so dig it. Um, how about some advice or a resource for the business side of doing this? If you know, you, you're teaching a lot of students who may want to do this for a living, what advice do you give to them about business? Ah, uh, boy. Um, I guess my only sort of business tip, the, the thing that, you know, you will be self-employed um, doing this kind of work. And so you really need a system for accounting, receipts, billing. And so I'm using um, Wave Apps for that. And it's really, really helpful. And it's so much easier than what I used to do, which was just sort of some ad hoc system of, you know, putting receipts in a shoebox. Right. Um, so I really recommend it. Um, so you just took me out to lunch, hypothetically. It'd be nice if you did, but we're, we're too far away. You just took me out to lunch. You're going to deduct that. What do you do at the checkout counter with your Wave app? Uh, well, I can take a picture of my receipt just right on my phone, and I can just I can email it to myself, or I can email it directly to Wave app, and it will automatically go into my accounting, into my receipts. And it's right there. It's smart enough to, you know, it reads everything and can deduct it. Um, it's, it's so easy. That's very cool. All right, great. Great tip. Um, anything you want to say about the organizational side of uh, doing a studio? You know, how do we keep our shit together? <laughs> uh, hmm. I guess I'll share a, uh, um, a productivity kind of idea, but um, I like using the uh, the Pomodoro system of, uh, when I'm working, especially if I'm mixing, so it's the idea that you work really concentrated for 25 minutes and then take five minutes off and yeah. then do it again and then do it again. Um, that's really helpful because we all say, like, it's really important to take breaks. But I find if I don't have a, a system or a bell or something that's telling me to do that, I won't do it. And so I'm much more productive if I take those breaks. So you can, you know, Google uh, Pomodoro system. There's all kinds of stuff about it. Yeah. The problem is it's too much fun to mix and play with computers and DAWs and all that <laughs> stuff. Right. Why would we want to take a break unless we just need another coffee <laughs> or, or some other uh, vice in the studio? Um, all right. Great. So, uh, you know, again, you're teaching students. Sometimes they want to know, what do I need to start with? Uh, how do I find people to record? And what should I do to survive and make ends meet while I'm doing this? What would you like to say about those three things? Well, I think probably like most people who have been on your show, I'd say, you know, you need a, you got to get a laptop and you've got to get, uh, you know, uh, an interface and a couple microphones. I would get like a cheap uh, eight eight channel interface and maybe two microphones, a dynamic, like a 57 or, and a, you know, cheap condenser. Mm -hmm. And, and then I would really focus on trying to make friends (laughs) so that, um, if I can get a community of people who are, you know, doing the same thing that I'm doing, if I, if I get a gig where I can, you know, I can call on my friends and say, hey, can I borrow your 414 and I'll loan you my, you know, my interface, that thing you have next week. If I can build a little community of friends who want to share, 
I can, um, I don't have to have all of that stuff all the time. It could be something as simple as like, I need to borrow mic stands, you know? Yeah. Um, so I would really focus on creating that community uh, as much as I could. Also, you know, I would put this out there, rock stars. Don't be surprised if there's somebody who actually rents microphones in your town. I know Nashville's, you know, we have, you know, an unparalleled ability to rent anything we want. But um, I, I remember even renting stuff like that when I was in St. Louis. You know, somebody's got a collection of mics that they'll rent you if you just need more mics for a session. Yeah, totally. I'm sure Boston does, right? Does Boston have rental companies for audio? There's some there's some smaller ones, and they tend to be more focused on audio visual, mm -hmm. but you can still get, you know, little things you need. And there's definitely been times when I've, I've, uh, I've used those just to, you know, maybe I need like a, a small like DPA instrument microphone that nobody has. I can just go rent one. It doesn't cost much. Yeah. And live sound companies, every town's got a live sound company and somebody who's got a PA. Uh, rock stars, don't be afraid to call them up and say, hey, I need a bunch of mic stands and mics so I can track a band in my house, you know, maybe not bothering the neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you, you could probably like get a, you know, a st temporary studio set up that way. Um, all right, Groovy. So we this last question is hypothetical as well. We're going to take the uh, Wayback Studio machine and you're going to go back and find young Matt. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, I guess you are uh, playing around with your Ford track at this point and you're <laughs> thinking about how cool recording is and, you, and you're going to go back and say, listen, young Matt, Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the recording studio one day. What advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Uh, I guess I would say um, be try to be of service. So uh, try try to remove what you want and and your your ego and your feelings about what you're doing from what you're doing and focus on uh, how you can serve what's happening, how you can serve the artist how you can serve the song, how you can serve the producer, whatever you're doing, make yourself of service because that's really what you're there for. Um, and I think it took me a little while to learn that. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think that's great advice. It's taken me a minute to learn it too, but once I learned it, it really <laughs> helped things go a lot smoother. Makes it easier to kind of get in and out of a session and not you know, carry the, all the worries with you as well. Absolutely. Um, when when I was starting out, you know, this job was my entire life, and at some point, that might not be enough anymore. You know, so it, it helps to learn to put it in perspective. Um, wonderful, Matt. Thanks so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us, dude. It's been a pleasure hanging out with us. And uh, even though we haven't gone as long as some interviews, you seem to have shared jam packed it with all kinds of useful tips. So we really appreciate that. <laughs> Um, okay. let, the, let the rock stars know how they can find you online if they want to uh, learn more about you, learn more about Q Division. Um, well, the probably easiest place to find me and to find out about Q Division would be the uh, Q Division website, which I believe is qdivisionstudios.com, the letter Q, divisionstudios.com. Uh, I have a page on there. You can hear some of my stuff. Uh, I think you can get in touch with me through there. Uh, I think... I also have a uh, website, it's not terribly active, but uh, Matt Bowden Music, and uh, you can actually contact me through there. Um, and another resource, if you want to learn more about the history of, of Q Division, um, would be, uh, there was a nice article in Tape Op several years ago, uh, Tape Op issue 78 would be a great place to start. Oh, great. Awesome. Awesome tips. Um, and then Rockstars, I will include links to this stuff in the show notes uh, as best I can. So just click through on your mobile device now or go to rsrockstars.com and find the blog post there. And then we'll try and include the uh, the Q region chart so you can print it out for your own studio. We'll keep the uh, the legend going. <laughs> we got to get that thing on a t-shirt. <laughs> awesome, man. Yeah, it's a good idea. I like that. Uh, maybe I can help do that. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for joining us on, this, on the podcast. Can't wait to meet you in person and I really appreciate it. All right. Take care, Alicia. All right. Talk soon, man. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. 
Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.